going to flash the screen a bit. Okay. Have to change servers so that Skype is recording this call on their servers. Okay. There you go. Now, I lost. So. I lost your face though. Oh, there you are. Yeah, there we go. All right. So, anyway, Joe, I really am glad to meet you. Yeah, it's you really nice to meet you too. American in France. I think that there's a um, a movie about that. Is there? <laughs> yeah, American. Uh, uh, I mean, Ger George Gershwin wrote a suite called American in Paris. No, I don't know it. <laughs> Never mind. Old stuff, 1930s, okay. but it was uh, high class music back then. Uh, so, um, anyway, we had started to talk about <clears throat> how the human mind has been programmed into the whole mentality of delayed gratification. Yeah. And uh, the way that I speak of that is to is to look at the various groups that we can see in society. And the, and I call this the GREB, G-R-E-B, for okay. government, religion, education, and business, big business. And they all four of them are in the same business. And that is, a, we can refer to it as the bait and switch. And um, uh, the, the reason that they're in the bait and switch is, is that they need you. They need workers. Yeah. They need voters. Yeah. They need students. And they need hands putting stuff into the collection plate. And so I often think of this, is this something that just is a self, like, like uh, something that's just happening on its own? Because I, I often find that when discussions like this come up, it's this thought that there's somebody malicious out there that's planning this all. And I, every I to, one of us is malicious, right? Yeah. I tend to just think that it's just sort of a automatic thing. That's just, that's it's just, not automatic. It's learned behavior. Yeah. But okay. humans have it are in that kind of society that in we that teach dynamic. ourselves to be mal uh, malicious and malevolent with each other out of self protection. Okay. Yeah. That it's a jungle out there, they think. Right. But really is what's happening is the, the jungle is in here. Right. Okay. So the uh, with business, they want you to buy their product. So they advertise it in a way of hoping or to get you to feel better about their product. In fact, um, uh, I just saw um, an interview with Elon Musk where he was talking about Apple that what Apple did was they gave a product out that made people feel good. Mm -hmm. And they rode that way for a long time, but now there's not much more you can put on a cell phone. Right. And so there's not much more new advancements, and so you're not likely to have quite such a crowd to stand in front of a closed store waiting for it to be opened. Right. But that's what it is all about is, is that uh, they they say also in the in the sense, if you build a better mousetrap, they will beat a path to your door. And the answer to that is, no, we don't need a better mousetrap. What we right. need is for them to think that this mousetrap is better. Mm. OK, and so this is where the subterfuge came in and it came in scientifically. I'm sorry, what did you say that what came in? Propaganda became oh, propaganda. scientific yeah. about a hundred years ago. There is a guy called um, Edward Bernays, who was a nephew of Sigmund Freud, and he learned from his uncle all about psychology, and he was the one that turned it into industrial psychology of how people who know the psychological tricks can control the masses. He actually worked for Hitler doing the propaganda machine. He also worked for the tobacco companies in the 1920s at a time when, uh, in those days, use of tobacco was taboo for women. It is something only men were allowed to do. How do you think that women started seeing it being okay to smoke? Edward oh. Bernays and the time of the suffrage movements when they were having big uh, um, open uh, marches and things like this, 
he hired debutantes and well-known women to be at the front of the line smoking cigarettes so that they could be photographed. And mm-hmm. so, so the use of tobacco for women then became a women's lib issue. Mm-hmm. And he did that intentionally. Mm-hmm. Since that time, look how many uh, decades they spent uh, advertising for peop- men to buy automobiles by putting a beautiful woman in a nice dress beside the car on the showroom floor. Mm. They still do that a bit, but in the 1950s, that was it. That was all there was to it. That, and the whole idea was you buy our car, you get a, a free woman. Or they called them a chick magnet. Mm. But it's a lie. But that lie is perp- uh, perpetrated, but it is a delicious lie. We like the idea that, oh, if I buy that car, I'll get a girl. And all I really get is a bunch of dents in a car that I don't want to have dents in and the right. mortgage. And often dealings with the law because I wasn't watching where I was driving because I was too interested in what's wrong with my car. <laughs> <laughs> so how so how do I root out this tendency in myself? Because I'm part of the society and it's obviously... It's obviously in me to some extent, too, you know, so how do I find this and root this out? Well, this is where the Buddha would recommend, and this is a big uh, part of the practice that can be put under the position of seclusion. Mm. But in fact, it's around the issues of seclusion that gave the whole concept of the modern meditation retreat. The 10 day retreat is the idea that people go into seclusion. Right. Guess what? You don't go into seclusion. You go into a crowded room and pretend you're in seclusion. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's yeah, not I've what had, the Buddha I've had that experience actually, because like I, I mean, running a farm, you're you're very secluded, and uh, I've actually gone to a retreat and it's been more social than uh, than my my personal life, and I've had this experience of being like, wait a minute, I I had better circumstances to practice at home than I do here. <laughs> Well, but. such is the nature of Western Buddhism. Yeah. It seems like almost everything is upside down. And the reason for it is, is because we don't have a set of standards that came from the beginning. As I had mentioned before in Asia, that the, uh, the, the teachings of the Buddha were spread by nobles within the Sangha, that they would go into with small groups and they would uh, live together and share the Dhamma with the local people, but they maintained that high quality of standard of living amongst themselves. Right. That never happened in Western Buddhism. How Buddhism came to the West was with Madame Blasky and Henry David Thoreau and Emerson and yeah. then with the literature of the 1880s with uh, Riles Davies and I.B. Horner and that group. And then you had uh, lecture tours with Alan Watts and T.D. Suzuki. But there was no Sangha in sight. Yeah. No cooperation in sight. No noble fire to, uh, to, to kick things off or to get things started. And so getting back to the point about seclusion, then, is that for the Western student, we need to understand that we need to do really to get away from it all, just as if we were at the retreat. Because, you know, the retreats, when you go there, they take away your book and your notebook and your cell phone and all and and many places, passports, anything like that, hopefully to uh, put your mind at ease so that you can watch what's going on inside. But what it winds up being is is that the students are not ready for uh, that kind of time structuring, that they've been structuring their time with their gadgets, and now they don't have their gadgets and they feel deprived. And instead of examining that feeling of being deprived and getting over it and say, hey, man, I'm really free from that stuff. No, they continue throughout that retreat feeling deprived. Mm. They don't get over it, and that's the whole point of it. So there's a lot of things that could be done in the retreats that would be useful that they wind up not getting done. And part of the reason for that is because the retreats themselves are run by Westerners who really don't understand the whole process of purification of the mind and what it's all about. But that's still left in Asia. Mm. Now, one of the things that I have found is that, in, in fact, this was going around long, long time ago, 
the idea that all oh, full enlightenment has been lost over the centuries and nobody gets fully enlightened and it's up to us westerners to try to figure out what the buddha actually meant yeah and so we get pragmatic dhammas this and that and, and all kinds of schemes and whatnot like that without realizing that the actual teachings of the buddha is alive and well in asia mm -hmm. That there are monks there that have been for centuries that have been teaching each other and know what's really that's going on. And that I had to stumble upon that to see it for myself. And I've over my lifetime, I have uh, had the occasion simply by being at the right place at the right time to really get my eyes open to that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. But in fact, I was invited into the Laotian community because I had a, a monk who was Lao. But he was raised in the United States and didn't speak Laotian very well. But when I taught him the Dhamma, uh, it turns out he had two uncles uh, who were uh, old time monks and he ratted on me to them. And I basically got summoned all the way from North Carolina, pre trip, by the way, to um, um, Denver because this monk wanted to know who this Westerner is that really knows the deep Dhamma. <laughs> But that let me know also that it wasn't just in Thailand with the association of Bhikkhu Buddha Dasa, because that was always the um, the card to get in, in the sense of, do you know Bhikkhu Buddha Dasa? If the monk don't know Bhikkhu Buddha Dasa, okay. If you do, then we've got a friend. That's a, a, that's an easy way for me to find my way around. Okay. But within the Lao community, you wouldn't expect them to know Bhikkhu Buddha Dasa. It's a different country, a different uh, um lifestyle in a way because it's very mountainous where we're here we're in the hot uh and so uh different lifestyles different language and all of that kind of stuff and they wouldn't know bhikkhu buddha dasa from south thailand because we're talking about what 12 1500 kilometer distance right uh but they still know the noble dhamma that the noble dhamma is widespread mm. And that one of the things that I uh, began to understand also that Bhikkhu Buddha Dasa was famous not because he made a personal big stir, but because he was plugged in to another network. Okay. A larger network of nobles, that mm. the noble Sangha had been noble right along. Mm. And it still is. And it still is. And there's lots of nobility within the, the Thai Sangha and that we have every opportunity to bring that noble Sangha mentality to the West without necessarily having to have every young man to ordain because that's a whole different bag of, of thing because of the, uh, the cultural differences. Right. That in fact, we don't want a whole bunch of them to ordain. We want like one guy at a time moving into one watt at a time. So that he could, that one Westerner can be around four, five, six, maybe ten other monks, or uh, around monks, so that he can learn the lifestyle of the monks, and the nobility of the and the high quality of the monks. And so this is what uh, uh, is much better done than uh, kind of the free for all, every man's for himself, individualistic way that uh, that is being approached in the West. Yeah. So the Buddha gave an analogy about the seclusion part because we're bouncing back and forth between um, the world and one's own mind. Are we going to associate with noble monks? But even then, in the beginning, we need to get into seclusion. Mm -hmm. The value of seclusion is, is that at least now all of the hearsay and the malicious gossip that you're hearing is generated within your between your ears. As opposed to when we're out in the world, we are blasted with propaganda almost nonstop. Yeah. Very scientifically from Edward Bernays onward. Okay, so we've got even more of an issue of being indoctrinated because they're doing the indoctrination uh, scientifically now, to where in the old days the indoctrination was just kind of haphazard, done with more brute force. You're either a good Christian or a dead lamb. Mm, yeah. Now they're, uh, but the whole society um, is built upon an instinctual way of living 
even though each human is capable of doing things wisely, that takes work. It takes effort to do things correctly. And so we would rather, why bother, just to fall back into our normal um, old habit patterns. Okay, and so we operate instinctively. You've probably even heard something like that the human only uses 10% of his brain. Have you heard something like that before? I think I've heard that somewhere. Okay, the reality is, is that he uses the whole thing and sometimes very, very excellently. The problem is he only uses it about 10% of the time. Okay. The rest of the time we're on automatic pilot. Right. Okay, and that that automatic pilot then is the way that we deal with the world, including the difference between the way that people drive cars, because we begin to uh, drive our cars on automatic pilot, not watching where we're going very well, and so we become very accident prone. Yeah. And part of the reason for that is because we have the concept of the right of way. This is mine. This is my lane. Mm. Okay, in Thailand, they don't have that concept. They have a concept called share the load. Yeah, I've seen that. <laughs> and, and that everybody is to, uh, number one, is to avoid any catastrophe. In the West, we've got actually people who capitalize on having a catastrophe. Right. Uh, in Thailand, people will back out of a driveway right into the road without looking at where they're going. But people will stop or go around or whatever. In the United States, the guy will actually hit that car. On purpose. Yeah. Almost on purpose, simply because yeah. the, the first thought is this, he shouldn't be there. And by the time the thought of you shouldn't be there. I mean, I recognize that hitting. mental state. You know, I'm still American, so I recognize that that mental state, that defilement is the, you know, I, I can see that. <laughs> Okay, well, that's that's one of the many tens of thousands of little propagandas that we've got that's all built up into uh, the way that we are supposed to live in our society. Right. Okay, getting off into seclusion is a very, very good um, analogy or a very good practice. And the Buddha had an analogy to it that I use in the form of uh, using Western language, especially Southern, is a log in a bog. Mm. Or a cypress in a swamp. OK, what happens to a cypress in the swamp is because of the nature of the cypress that when it falls over, it will float. But slowly over time, it will get completely waterlogged and it will go to sink down to the point that there's only a very small amount of the log on the surface. And right. then even later, it'll go to the bottom. Right. OK. Can you take one of those logs that is fully waterlogged and set it on fire? Now, in the time of the Buddha, they had professional fire starters. Now we have cigarette lighters, fire chats, um, uh, drill lighters, all kinds of things with spark plugs and things. But in the old days and the time of the Buddha, I guess you could say it was all a matter of rubbing. Right. So uh, the question is, can you get one of those logs that's in the bog and set it on fire? You better have a really big fire going beforehand. Or else well, we already no know that we don't have that. All we've right. got is a, a professional fire starter who knows yeah, rubbing. No, that's not happening. That's not happening. Okay. No. Not going to happen. OK, but if we take that log and put it up on the shore, can now we light it on fire? Uh, if you let it dry out. Uh, <laughs> I don't know, wait a minute now. We just drug it up on shore and it's still waterlogged. OK, uh, if it's still waterlogged, that, I mean, from my experience, lighting fires, no, it's not going to start. All right, but if we leave it in the sun and let the, uh, the, the water collect at the bottom of the log because it's a um, gravity thing as well as the sunshine, then at the top of the log, it's going to be available so that you can set that on fire after yeah. a while. Yeah. Okay, guess what? This is how they made dugout canoes in the old days. Right. This is the easy way to do it. Is right. to take a waterlogged bog. It's already cut down. It's in the bog. You drag it up and uh, wait it, and then start it on fire, and then you can chip it out. But guess what? Now that the uh, the log is completely dried out and hollowed out, now we can put it back in the bog, and it doesn't sink. Now it's a canoe. Now it's transportation. Mm. 
Mm. Okay. So this analogy then of getting the log out of the bog and letting it dry out is basically the same thing as what we're trying to do in a 10 day course, but 10 days is not long enough. Okay. And then in fact, if the students are not practicing correctly, it doesn't matter how long it takes. Mm. And if but you are practicing if, correctly, how long does it take? It depends upon you because you're, if you're practicing correctly right this very minute, that's all it needs. <laughs> right. Right. That this is also very much uh, a, a teaching of Zen, but it's very much the teaching also of the Buddha that everything has to do with right here, right now. Right. So if you are having an enlightened thought right here, right now, then in this moment, right here, right now, you're enlightened. Except the problem is, is that the Westerners will look at that word enlightened thought. And then they'll make a big deal out of it. That it's got to be a super duper whoop de doo kind of thought. Right. And so we go around searching and grasping and clinging over super duper uh, fancy thoughts, thinking that now that's the path. Mm. But really, what uh, is better understood is the enlightened thought is any thought that's not heavy. Wholesome thoughts. And there's quite a lot of wholesome thoughts. And if we're having a wholesome thought and we're not heavy, then we're light. Voila, that's all there is to it. Right here, <laughs> right now. Mm. And and this is missed in the West because of that uh, built-in programming, the, um, uh, the confirmation bias is so widespread in the West of delayed gratification. Right, right. But this could be turned to one's advantage. In the sense that you have been do doing a whole lot of stuff that you were told to do, often resenting it, but you did it anyway, and you still didn't get any gratification for it. Mm. Don't you think that you've got a whole store of gratification built up that you could tap into right now and just feel successful and, and easy? Go, wow, I've done so much. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And so we can turn that into our advantage by beginning to have wholesome thoughts, friendly thoughts to ourselves and to the world. Once we get that wholesome, friendly, um, noble, uh, wholesome thought attitude within ourselves, now we can go back into the bog like the canoe can go back once it's cleaned out and hollowed out. Okay. And so this is the, the practice and that we can see that in um, there was a, there's a sutta called the half sutta, H-E-L-F, half sutta. What, I'm sorry, what is it? H -E -E? Half, one half. Oh, half sutta. One okay. over okay. two. Okay. <laughs> one half, H-A-L-F. Okay. And in this half sutta, uh, Ananda comes from Sariputta, his teacher, and tells uh, his um, uh cousin and the Buddha that uh, Sariputta says that friendship is half of the Dhamma, half the teaching. That's the that Buddha big. It's that big a deal. Yeah, the Buddha, and the says, Buddha it's says teaching. No, it's not. It's, ha it's not just half. It's the entire teaching. Yeah. Now, in one way, we can say that friendship can be seen as the way that we're friendly to other people, and that would be the half on the outside. But okay. then becoming friendly with ourselves on the inside, being nurturing rather than critical. Mm -hmm. This is where it really comes down to is our unwholesome thoughts are actually just malicious gossip that we're telling ourselves about ourselves and about other people. And if we would stop having those kind of thoughts and start having nurturing, wholesome thoughts instead, then we're there we are right there, right then and there. That's it. There's all there is to it is to just be happy, just uh, relax. And so this actually is the um, the overall picture of the entire teaching of the Buddha that is referred to as Dukkha, Dukkha Naroda. Which means then that there's got a reason or a cause for this suffering, or actually it's not suffering. In fact, if you advertise it as suffering the way that it has been in English, then a lot of people go around saying, I'm not, I don't need Buddhism because I'm not suffering. 
Right. I'm miserable, but I'm not suffering. <laughs> but if when you understand it, that any of the most slight dissatisfaction is yeah. dukkha, whatever it is, and the dukkha, is, the life itself is not inherent with dukkha or dissatisfaction, that in fact, everybody really wants to live. Yeah. If you don't believe me, stop breathing for five minutes and then see that, wait a minute, I really do want to take that next breath. And not only that, but that breath is life-giving. But normally we ignore how life-giving our breathing is, how marvelous it is to stay alive if you take this next breath. That's how wonderful it is. But we don't pay any attention to that. But when we start to look at what's going on, that's why we start to focus on the breath. But when I say focus, I mean actually begin to control the breath. Right. Because this is where the Mahasi method uh, that's gotten to the West. Now, Mahasi himself talks about it the way that Bhikkhu Buddha Dasa does, uh, using words like fall upon. And when we use fall upon, we mean it the same way that thieves will fall upon a victim on the, on the highway. We jump on him. We grab him, we seize him, okay? And so uh, we should treat every object of meditation that way, that we seize it and take control of it. It's not a matter of just um, a bland observation, right. but it's full on, uh, uh, ter- <laughs> instead of using, let us say, instead of using a flashlight for your investigation, you want to use a pair of pliers and a screwdriver. Okay. <laughs> is to take things apart and look at them. That's the uh, the way that that we're going to seize the object, and we do that with the breath also, in the sense of a long, deep in breath and a long, deep out breath, using mindfulness. In fact, the sutta talks about mindfully he breathes in long, right. mindfully he breathes out long. Now that's talking about really putting some skin in the game. But the way that it's practiced in the West is just just to note the breath or just to kind of watch it. And then the mind will wander away from the breath very easily. Okay, it's very, very much like that. You've got a bird that you're holding in your open hand. That bird's going to fly away easily. But if you've got your hand closed on that bird and holding it, even though it struggles, you've got it. Mm -hmm. You're not going to let that thing go. Okay, this is how we need to start practicing our meditation. And many people mistake this for concentration. No, we're not concentrating, but we are taking control. That's a major difference. So when when we recognize then that dukkha has this cause to it, and the cause is uh, that when we like things, we uh, if we like it ignorantly, if we like something that's just likable, we say, oh, that's nice. But if we like it ignorant, then when you say, oh, if I look at it again, I'll like it again. And if I own it, I'll like it a lot. So I feel good if I own it. So this is what we mean by greed is is that because we want to own and control physical objects or people or other things like that, instead of really taking control of the things that we can control, and that is our own breathing, our own thoughts, that kind of thing. And so uh, by liking something, I want it. I like that car. I want to buy it. Especially the, the, the car that I've got in my mind, not the one that they're going to sell me. I don't want the car they want to give me. I want the car that I'm dreaming about. That's the car I go to buy. Why, why do you think that there's so many traditions that just tell you to just observe, like where it's, it's always... Uh, you know, in like the Guenka, it's just observe reality as it is. And, and they don't tell you to uh, to allow your breath to become deep. And why do you think it becomes so like misconstrued like that with, uh, because I, I know I got, I got stuck for a really long time in my practice, not realizing this, that it was okay to enjoy my breath and to take a longer, deeper breath, that that was okay. I have my suspicions that it happened between the, let's say, 300 A.D. and 450 A.D. I think the Visuddhimagga and the... Right, between yeah. the uh, uh, Pachasubhidhimagga and the Visuddhimagga. Yeah. That was the time period. 
Okay. So it's been a long time. <laughs> it's been a long time. And that, that was, this is, by the way, also uh, a time when the historians now that have been doing a lot of research uh, divide Buddhism into three, kind, three time frames in the sense that original ancient Buddhism, which had the idea of the Arahat, the one who was above it all, the one who had his own mind cleaned out. But then about, uh, let us say, the turn of the century at the time of Christ, we can call it, uh, it turned into the Mahayana, which is may all beings be happy, coming from the idea of metta into all beings become enlightened before I become enlightened. Right. Right. The big boat, all of that kind of stuff. The problem right. with the big boat is everybody wants to passenger. Nobody wants to be the uh, 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 the slave okay. in the galley that's shoveling coal okay. or the ro- oarman. Nobody right. wants to steer this thing. Everybody wants to ride as a passenger. Mm. But with the idea of the small boat, it's up to you. You have to paddle and you have to figure out which way you're going. Mm. All right. So uh, that Mahayana uh, lasted for about 500 years, giving way to at about the time that we're talking about in the Vasudhimaka, where Tantra came in. Let me be one with everything. And by being one with everything, that means that now I can control everything kind of magically. This is where magical Buddhism really took off. Okay. And we're still left with the remnants of that with all kinds of Tantra practices and sexuality and 10,000 other things. But it's a later form of Buddhism. Yeah. And what they practice mostly in Thailand is trying to get back to the Buddha as best we can. Yeah. With the with the uh, uh, the friendship of those who already understand the deeper teachings, anyway, that the um, Sudhimaga, it's actually interesting to watch uh, over the course of many decades how Bhikkhu Buddha Dasa uh, uh, responded to the Vasudhimaga from uh, in the early days. Well, it's about ninety five percent correct, but it's really got some problems in there into where's that next book to throw on the fire we're going to get rid of this stuff <laughs> <laughs> but slowly slowly over the uh, long period of time so now he's ready to have the Vasudhi Maga and the Abhidhamma just thrown into the ocean okay because we don't need that kind of stuff and in fact it's what the westerners really love they really love the um, intellectualism of it yeah yeah I know I've, I've been stuck with that before. I mean, I, I've been the one trying to figure out how to buy a copy of the Visuddhi Maga and thinking that it was great. And yeah, but I, I've also I've heard your arguments about it, saying that you think that it's maybe a scholar monk that wasn't necessarily practicing himself, possibly. And mm-hmm. having explored it myself, I, I tend to think that it feels a lot a lot like it could be like that because I, I recognize the qualities from other sort of scholar scholar monks nowadays and it's it's similar mm-hmm. you know uh the sort of style and stuff and uh yeah it makes sense but it does appeal right. to the western mind <laughs> well it it has a uh, especially with the Vasudhi manga has a big slather of magical thinking yeah and that fits into a lot of westerners you could almost say um that You've probably heard, uh, and there's a lot of evidence that uh, Christianity is losing people fairly quickly in the United States, as well as has all over the world, lost a lot of population. Well, it's possible that quite a number of those people are, um, let us say, disappointed in either the politics of the church or the religion itself. Or it can be that uh, the magical stories didn't pan out. Yeah. In that regard, now they're looking for something else and they wind up with both Hinduism and Buddhism, but they're still looking for magic that they that they weren't fulfilled with in Christianity. And here they find Buddhism that's got a whole lot of magic built into it with possibly a method of attaining such stuff. Mm. And so this is where a lot of meditators come in, is they're meditating because they want something. 
you probably heard the old Zen tale where the Zen student walks in to the master who's sitting over in the corner in the water or something and says, Master, are you meditating to become enlightened? The old man says, man, I'm just sitting here because I am. So that's the way that we approach it is meditation is is getting into that state that this is really, really nice. We don't need anything. But yeah. many people are practicing meditation to get something that they don't get while they're back practicing meditation, maybe next time. Mm-hmm. And so this is the basic way of, of introducing how we're actually going to practice the Eightfold Noble Path so that we can find immediately how to get into the third noble truth. If if the cause of suffering is greed, ill will, and delusion, let's stop greed, let's stop ill will, let's stop delusion right very, right very now. <laughs> yeah. And here we are in third noble truth, which by the way is the word sukha, which is exactly opposite of the word dukkha. Right. And that sukha, by the way, is also a word that's used in Anapanasati as a skill to be developed. Number six. Okay. And when we see little connections like that, we begin to see, wait a minute, this whole teaching of the Buddha, when we look, when we approach it correctly, is a very, very integrated, tight, little teaching. It's not vast. Right. And yet look at the intellectual Buddhists. They want it vast. Right. Yeah. And it's not. It's not vast at all. It's just some uh, some simple little things that we can do, and that part of the complexity is that we have, or the seeming complexity is, is that we have four of these and three of those and four more of those and five of this and four of those and eight of those and nine of those and sixteen of them things and twelve of this, that, and the other, right? And that gets people really, really confused until we recognize that, no, there's actually a sequence in there. Yeah. That the Four Noble Truths is actually nothing but Dukkha, Dukkha Naroda, unpacked. And that when we recognize that is uh, part of the unpacking is into the Four Foundations of Mindfulness, which is merely a convention that the Buddha borrowed from the ancient times, Because they had the four primary elements, and this was all over the place. I mean, it was in in the time it was in Greece, in Persia, in Egypt, in India, everywhere. They had four elements, solid, liquid, gas, and fire. Those were the four elements. So much of Buddhism is actually founded upon this, and it's also the Ayurvedic medicine that the Four Noble Truths actually comes from Ayurvedic medicine. Okay. What's the disease? What's the cause? What is it going to be like when you're free? And here's the and here's the medicine to take to 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 solve it. Okay. And so we need to practice getting into that state of third noble truth of becoming satisfied, as opposed to being dissatisfied. We practice being satisfied. That's so, what we're actually doing. Instead of noting the dissatisfaction and then noting more dissatisfaction and then noting some more dissatisfaction or noting some ordinary and then some dissatisfaction again, instead we're going to notice the dissatisfaction and change it right then. Right. Throw that thought out. And and there's and this is getting into like right right effort. Like uh so so you're more of a fan of sort of uh yeah like the the right effort path i i know Ad, adan sona talks about this a lot of uh that you know the different steps of what you can do with uh with these thoughts and and one of the things is is you get to the point of you can suppress you can suppress the thought uh at at the end of it that uh and it's seen in the west as such a negative thing uh, to re- you know, there's you can replace the thought, and I, I can't remember. It's another one of these numbered list right. things. But I understand that exactly. Let's use this analogy. Imagine that yeah. you've got a dark room that's an ordinary room with ordinary kinds of furnitures and whatnot like that. What the thing is is that all the doors and windows are completely closed, okay. and it's completely dark, and you cannot okay. see anything. It is absolutely everything. All the windows completely taped up and blacked out. Okay. And, and before you go in, when you walk in there, you see a black cat on the floor and then you close the door 
Now your job is to catch that black cat. How could you catch that black cat in a completely darkened room that's got regular furniture and things like that for the cat to hide behind? It's not going to happen. Yes, it will. Well, All I guess you need to do is to go sit down search. on the floor and wait. Ah. And the cat, and the cat will come. Mm. Yeah, that's true. Mm. Yeah, the cat will come. Mm. One thing about cats, they've got jealousy. I've seen yeah. that. <laughs> They're good at being jealous. Yeah. Uh, dogs are jealous, too. It's really fun to watch them. Anyway, um, this is how we have it. That Many people think that they have to suppress or to grab hold of the mind and squeeze it tight. Mm -hmm. I will give you this analogy. Um, in that uh, sense, imagine that you were standing on a road and a big lorry or a semi comes barreling down the highway and there you are standing in the highway. Okay. You've got three choices. One is you can do a Popeye routine, which is what we're talking about. Stand in the road with your great big fist out and some spinach and stop that thought. Yeah. That's what we're talking about. The other one is what they call choices awareness and that just let that thought run right over us. It's okay. Okay. <laughs> which okay. is generally what happens anyway. All right. You're going to get run over whether you're trying to stop it or not. OK, but then there's the Buddhist practice and the Buddhist practice is just stand out of the road. Get out of the way. Stand aside, go someplace else. Mm -hmm. OK, and so this is what then me, we mean is, aha, uh -huh, I see you, Myra, it means I can see that truck coming down the road and now I have an opportunity. In fact, by saying the word, aha, uh -huh, I see you, Myra, We've already had a new thought. That's a new thought. It's not the same old thought that is that's running true. us down. OK, yeah, so true. aha, and that's done joyfully. So we can start right off with as soon as we have sati, as soon as we wake up, as yeah. soon as we have the realization of look at what I'm doing. I don't have to think about that. I can sit here and be relaxed and happy instead. Mm -hmm. So this is actually the practice of Anapanasati. And that it is so clearly spelled out in the suttas once you learn how to read it. Mm. That in fact, there's a number of suttas that talk about this in the sense of the hindrances must be cleared out of the mind. Yeah. I do not know of any place in any of the suttas where it starts off with the students practicing anything at all while their mind still has hindrances. Right. Okay. Okay, that in fact, in the, uh, 111 in the sutta where uh, the Buddha is talking about uh, Sariputta's uh, practice, he talks about it first off, that Sariputta has huge amounts of wisdom. He's got laughing wisdom. He's got joyful wisdom. He's got sharp wisdom. He's got focused wisdom. And how did he get that? It says he practiced for two weeks, a fortnight, which is like between a new moon and a full moon. And... What did he do? The first thing it says, quite secluded from uh, unwholesome mental states, quite mm. secluded. He enters and abides in the first jhana. Yeah. Everything that we do has is geared towards going into the first jhana, which is normally nowadays because there is a, a kind of meditation that's practiced that's not first jhana, is referred to as a dry meditation. Often the Mahasi method is considered a dry meditation. Yeah. Okay. So, Why is it dry? Is because it's devoid of the very things that the Buddha requires in order to practice correctly. But it didn't, the whole idea of wet and dry didn't even come about until the mistake had already been made that there is a dry kind of meditation. Right. So I, I, this actually gets. And that was that done long ago. That's an old, old, old uh, mistake that it was made. Hmm. So I, I wanted to ask about the jhanas a little bit. That is, is it enough with the like, if you can reach the first jhana, is that enough? Like, not in terms of is that enough, but if, you know, there's, there's sort of there's certain teachers who emphasize going through all of the jhanas, going through all eight jhanas, and like I. My okay, hang on, honk, honk, yep. back up. Yeah. There is no place in the suttas that eight jhanas are mentioned at all. 
Right. Yeah, I, I know. And then, yeah, and that's what I was going to say is there's other teachers who like will mention that fact. And, uh, and all. so, so you're saying you just like the first John is it's, it's okay. Like I will say it like this. Anything that you can do in any jhana, you can do in the first jhana. But okay. once you've gotten into the jhanas, why do all of that work when you can get even more relaxed? Okay, what, what do you mean by that? Well, I just gave you the secret, didn't I? That this is a process of relaxation. And the first relaxation right. we have is to get out of the tight mind. Uh, that's a hindered mind that hinders us from being in the first jhana, which means that every thought, you know, applied and sustained thought means that you apply the mind to the wholesome and sustain it there. Right. Until you get it to the point that every thought, one after another, one uh, thought after another as they occur is always a wholesome thought. Right. This is explained in great detail in Sutta number 19 that, by the way, the name of it is dog dog, two kinds of thought. It's also uh, referenced in the uh, 117 in the Great 40 that one's right effort is to remove unwholesome thoughts and to put in the mind wholesome thoughts. Then you yeah. have in the Satipatthana Sutta, you have it in other places about the hindrances in the sense that they have to be removed. Mm. It's only in the Mahasi method that they get the idea that you don't have to remove the hindrances and they do that by saying that, well, jhana is hard. It's not easy to do. So instead of saying, well, since jhana is hard to do, let me go ahead and do what I need to do with first jhana, but I'll do without it. It's almost like now that my car has a flat tire and I don't know how to change the tire, I'm just going to drive it on a flat tire. Well, you might get someplace that way. You might wind up in a ditch. Yeah. And you might wind up with great big repair bills, and it may be a good idea instead of driving that car on a flat tire is to get that tire pumped up. Especially since you've only got one tire. You're going to run around with one only one tire and it's flat. <laughs> you want to pump that thing up. And so this is the whole point of it then, and this is why the Buddha on several occasions and in many different ways says that my teaching, in fact, in 36, when he actually comes out of the, the creek that he fallen in and with recognition that, uh, hey, if I can't even stand up and walk out of the ditch, how can I, in fact, get my mind into enlightenment? That's when he changed his whole practice. And this is when he figured out, aha, I see you, Myra, that put it all together that it has to do with actually something that he was practicing long before, and that is the first jhana. Mm. Then he says, surely, why am I afraid of the pleasures of first jhana? Because they are not the same pleasures of sensuality, because he had been doing all of that self-flagellation stuff with the James, right. and so he yeah. was justifying that for himself. But the point is, is that it is the first jhana. When you read that sutta from 111, Everything that's mentioned about what needs to be done through the jhanas, all of those things are listed in the first jhana. So anything that you can see when you're in first jhana, you can see it and you can look at it because you're in the first jhana. But one of the things that we would want to do eventually is instead of having one wholesome thought after another to apply and make sure that we're sustaining but it might be a good idea to start to put some gaps between that thought and relax between those wholesome thoughts. And so if we can relax during the wholesome thoughts, then we can come to a state that doesn't have all of this applied and sustained wholesome thoughts because that feeling of feeling really good, feeling satisfied, feeling on top of the world, um, uh, Lokatara or the super mundane above it all, that transcendent feeling, the feeling of, uh, you could call it bliss, uh, other people, we look for that in the sense of um, uh, when people win the Olympics, why would anybody bother to join the Olympics? What's the point? Um, it's the win. Yeah. It's that gold medal. Yeah. And the feelings that are associated with that, that's what we all want. Okay, so the development of the first jhana is to develop that feeling. And we do it by talking ourselves into it with wholesome thoughts, one wholesome thought after another until finally you're a gold medalist in your own mind. Mm -hmm. Or as um, 
I think it's in uh, Dirty Harry in one of those movies. He's a legend in his own mind. <laughs> but we're actually going to use that. We're going to develop that so that we feel really good about ourselves. But once we are in that state of feeling, we can let the thoughts associated with it go and just sit there in a state of really marvelous, I've got this wired. Mm. That's the second genre. But then sitting there with that uh, kind of understanding, I've got this wired because it feels so good, even that's a little bit more effort than we need to put in. I'll relax out of the, the pity, back into the sukha, and just be satisfied. And then I can even let that uh, satisfaction in the third jhana melt into everything is just so easy. Everything is so easy. And that's the upeka of the fourth jhana. This is actually stuff people do this on a regular basis. In fact, many meditators go in and out of the fourth jhana and they don't have a clue about what they're doing. Because they do it in such a, uh, a very quick method that they don't uh, rely there. And so what happens generally is those students who can develop first jhana do it with greed for the second jhana. Right. So without really developing the first jhana, without really getting the skills of the first jhana so that you can abide and sustain the mind into the wholesome, they jump right into the thoughtlessness of the second jhana if they could do it. Most of them fail at it. But if they can do it, Guess what happens when they come out of the second jhana? They go back into the hindrances because that's their habit pattern. Mm -hmm. But if we develop solidly the first jhana, then when we come out of second jhana, our landing point is the first jhana. Okay. Which means our mind lands back into wholesome thinking. Okay. That makes now, sense. I do not recommend driving a car while you're in poor jhana. In fact, <laughs> it's downright dangerous. <laughs> That you have to be prepared and 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 uh, be in the right environment for this kind of stuff. Right. Um, but it's not magical. In Western Buddhism, these jhanas have always uh, appeared magical. And back, basically what it is, is how fast is the mind? To, because what happens is we have what you would call a default position. Almost like a switch that's spring loaded. And if you don't hold that position down, it's going to spring back into the old way of doing it. The automatic pilot automatically takes over. And we have to continue to wrest control away from the instincts, away from the automatic pilot, and come back and use the, the better part of our mind, our wisdom part, to see things the way that they really are, rather than assuming that they are the way that they used to be, because that's how we felt then, because that's the instincts. Okay, so you can think of the instincts as basically like a box to carry garbage in. And if we begin to see the, the, uh, both the garbage and the box itself, then we can be rid of it. Okay. We can see that this is instinctual behavior, and I don't have to behave instinctually. I can, be, I can feel the way that I want to feel. Now, right. that's actually the weird part is, is that how, why do people go around feeling bad when they want to feel good? In Good fact, question. they're pursuing feeling good on a regular basis and they're constantly failing at it and wind up feeling bad again. Mm. Right? But the idea is, is that you want to feel good, but we've been lied to about how to do that. Um, one of the old songs is looking for love in all the wrong places. And wow, does that fit the meditator? Mm. The meditator is the one who is out there looking for love in all the wrong places. But guess what? He's doing the same thing he did before he started meditating, looking for love in all the wrong places. Right. right? By buying something, by getting an education, by joining a religion, by getting baptized, by joining a group, by paying your tax, by voting. Right. This is all of that stuff that they learn to control you. And guess what? Whether you vote or not, it doesn't change the way you feel. In fact, voting may get you really angry. And who wants to be angry? Nobody. Well, then that means that we're not following what is natural for us. At right. any particular moment, look at how you feel and recognize right now you can feel the way you want to. Why are you talking yourself into feeling bad right now when you could talk yourself into feeling good? This is the entire teaching of the Buddha about that unwholesome versus wholesome thought. In the Anapanasati Sutta, it is called gladdening the mind.
Now, the word gladdening is an English word, English language word. A better word would be brightening the mind. Brightening the mind. Okay. Uh Uh-huh. Brightening the mind by uh, putting lightweight thoughts in it instead of heavy thoughts. Right. This is the whole teaching of the Buddha, is to change, to look at what we're doing. And so this is where the Eightfold Noble Path actually comes in, because we're talking about the Eightfold Noble Path as the Buddha's way of practicing Anapanasati. In fact, Bhikkhu Buddha Dasa is quite famous for making a statement that, that everybody grumbles about, but nobody can find any disagreement with it. And what he said was the Buddha only taught one kind of meditation. And that was Anapanasati. That was the only thing. He did not teach choiceless awareness. He did not teach Mahasi method. He did not teach this, that, and the other thing with shamans and drugs and 10,000 other stuff. He only taught this one practice of meditation as a fulfillment for the Eightfold Noble Path, Mm -hmm. which has to do with one's right view, one's right... um, uh, remembrance or sati to wake up and look at what you're doing to remember to look and when you see with discernment you have a choice now of either changing it with right effort or leaving it the way that it was and when you change it with right effort that means that you're gladdening the mind you're put, you, in, in fact at that point in time that's the applying of the mind into the wholesome after we apply it into the wholesome and start talking to ourselves into it, we begin to feel good. So the question now, can we sustain that and continue to feel, uh, continue to talk about the way that we feel in the sense that we want to feel rather than the fearful, full of anxiety, needing to do stuff in order to feel good, we can actually talk about the reality of this moment is, is that it's safe. Mm that I really don't have to do anything right now. I could just be safe right. and comfortable and content. And comfort is one of the things that's important there. Uh, but in the Mahasi method and other meditations, people are supposed to sit so long that they become uncomfortable. But right. the actual definition of sukha is to be comfortable. Mm-hmm. So don't practice in a way that causes discomfort because now you're going in the wrong direction. But that's very Western. you got to have some pain in order to get some gain. Right. So have your pain now and the gain will come someday in the future is the right. way that they practice. Right. So let's get some really ferocious pain going here. You know, so like sometimes I, I do um, like experiment with like lay, like laying down med- meditation in order to like not have back pain because uh, I just from years of work and stuff I physically do have back pain if I sit for long periods of time but the problem is is that I I find that my mind gets really focused on this sort of yeah this sort of guilt and this sort of like oh but I'm laying down and it and it's and it's quite unnatural in a way or something or like I whose rule are you breaking yeah, my it's my own stupid sure you thing. You've heard like, that rule. Whose rule are you breaking? Is this my, is this Gawanka's rule? No, it's my it's my own that I make for myself. You know, it's just some stupid thing that I'd come up with, you know. Well, you see, the Gawanka's method, they want them so that they can watch what's going on and see what's going on. They want the people in the meditation hall. Mm-hmm. And so the instruction is, oh, uh, this meditation hour, don't feel like that you can go down go lay down and take a nap because you're tired or whatever like that, that you can't get in. You'll say, oh, I can meditate while I'm laying down and you can't do that. And so that's actually taught. Yeah. Guess what? The Buddha taught all four postures. Uh huh. Sitting is only one of them. Standing, walking, walking and laying, laying down. down. Yeah. Okay, yeah. all four postures that, in fact, the best time for meditation is when you lay down at night, getting ready to go to sleep. Yeah. And having some good wholesome thoughts rather than the normal kind of thoughts that prepare us for a night of dreaming. Yeah. I mean, I, I do that at night and I do that in the morning. Uh, you know, I, and, I, and I hear that I, I often chant like the Meta Sutta and it says it in that, you know, wh- when they're standing, walking, seated or lying down free from drowsiness. You know, and but there, but there's there's still some like it's 
I mean, I, I don't think it's the Guenka thing. I think it's just some like it's yeah, definitely some Western, Western pain, Buddhism. Western pain mentality thing mm -hmm. that I have going on. You know, right? It's the Western Buddhism and that Western mentality. You could have not. You could have not had to have heard that from a Western person in order to have developed that um, uh, what you would call confirmation bias. Yeah. That you develop that all on your own out of no pain, no gain mentality. Yeah. How dare I yeah, lay yeah. down and and take it easy and oh, be I grew, comfortable? I mean, I, when, I grew up with. I mean, I grew up in a sports family, you know, and like that's that was. I heard that a million times. No pain, no gain. You know, like that's just the the way that it was. You know. Well, what it winds up with is a whole lot of pain and not a lot of gain. <laughs> that's true. It does. Even yeah. if you win the Olympics with your all that pain that you put in, there's in fact some particular sports. One of them is the gymnastics that they have young teenage girls do to where they're to height of their profession at about 16. And after that, they're downhill. And by the time they're 25, they're crippled. Yeah. Yeah. All pain, no gain. So he got a good gain when he was 16. He got a gold medal. And now he's got real heavy body problems for the rest of his life. Yeah, yeah, That's I've, I've got I've of, got that a little bit. <laughs> my 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 right arm is uh, I, I have to give it a lot of compassion from a lot of years of sports. So, yeah. Yes. So this whole mentality is the Western mentality of it's got to be a lot of work to where, in yeah. fact, um, there are many, many little tiny clues, but those clues have become obscured partially with the translation and partially because of our own confirmation bias. We don't really understand exactly what we're reading. It's right there in front of us, but we yeah. miss it. Um, and so uh, an example of that is step four of Anapanasati is to relax. Hmm. But they use the word tranquility and now it's something magical. Right. Right. And so to just relax, just, you know, hang out and relax. And in fact, the word Nibbana, they've made a great big high pollutant word with that. And Bhikkhu Buddha Dasa has a book on Nibbana for everyone. Mm -hmm. And he talks about little Nibbanas, which is exactly what we're talking about. Just chill out. Okay. You've got Nibbana when you just chill. Just chill, baby. Okay. <laughs> but in Thai language, they say Jayan, Jayan. Jai is the heart, cool heart, cool off. And so this is Nibbana, and yet we have such a magical idea about all of this stuff. But that magical idea of Buddhism is, is let us predisposed in the reader, not in the book. Mm. The reader brings the magic to the book, and then he sees all of the magic in the book, and they say that Buddha, and then they insist that Buddhism is all about magic, when in fact it's not at all. It's about freedom from many things, including freedom from the desire of magic. Mm. But the real magic is, is that you're happy without any magic. That you don't need, and see, one of the reasons why people want magic, they want magical powers, because they think that the magical powers will protect them from the dangers of life. But the real power is being fearless. Mm. You're not afraid of anything. Right. Why? Because everybody that you meet is your friend, not your enemy. Mm. And so they're not dangerous. Even if when they're trying to be, you can't touch me. <laughs> mm. And so this is an attitude that we gain. So actually, we're talking again uh, and continuing about the Eightfold Noble Path in the sense of right investigation to look what kind of thought, what kind of feeling, what's going on in the body, what's going on in the mind, what's going on in the, um, in the reality of the vicinity around and the right of uh, the right sati to wake up and start practicing and doing that to wake up is what I, I use that term better than mindfulness, because mindfulness doesn't mean anything to anybody. It's a bad translation. But yeah. in fact, I, I never heard of the word mindfulness until Buddhism. It's mm. not a word that's common in use. And when it's now becoming common in use is because it's used in reference to Buddhism. Right. 
But that's not what the Buddha taught. He didn't teach mindfulness. He taught wakey, wakey, wake up, sati, right. notice, look what you're doing. Right. And then the right effort to change that right here, right now, and come out of it, have have that enlightened thought right now. Yeah. And that enlightened thought is, get out of here. I don't need you. I can be happy instead. I don't have to think about all the work I've got to do. I can just sit and relax for the moment. <laughs> when we do that over and over again, we develop what is called sama sankapa, or right attitude. Now, it's normally translated wrongly as either right thought or right intention. But really, we're talking about right attitude, to change your attitude from being a loser that's trying hard that is performing, hoping to get some gain and take on the attitude. We've got this. I can handle that. Almost in a joking way, hold my beer. You ever heard that expression? Hold my beer? Yeah. Hold my beer. <laughs> yeah. Right here. I got to go take care of something. I'm going to do it. Just hold my beer. I'll be right back. It's not going to yeah. take long. <laughs> Okay, that's definitely the winner's attitude, and and that's something to be developed, that can-do attitude. And the yeah. Buddha states it in the sense of um, hindrances of obstructions. When the student knows that he can, no matter how obstructed the mind is with hindrances, he can clean that out and come back to this present moment to see how things really are. Now, this is actually stated, that's... The, Direct statement in the it's a loose translation, but that's directly what the Buddha said is the first knowledge, the first step on the noble path is when you get enough mojo, when you get enough strong right attitude that you know that no matter what's going on, you can handle it. Mm. You can take care of this, you can take care of it with a plum and with aloofness and mm. get it done. Mm. And so, with that mentality. That's the right noble attitude that then brings about right noble organization of mind, that we begin to get our mind organized. Now, the Pali for this is sama area samati, but the word samati has been wrongly translated into concentration. Mm -hmm. The word actually, the word samati means to gather together the factors. Okay. So when you when we have the first jhana, that means that we've gathered together the factors of first jhana, and that's a kind of samadhi. When we get the mind organized together, then when it's unified and organized, that means that it's um, uh, samadhi mind. Now let me give you this example: um, is that imagine a great big grandfather clock. Okay. All right. And if it's samati, that means that all the gears are clean, there's right oil, and it's ticking along just fine, and everything is correct. It's just a samati. As opposed to taking that same clock and taking the sledgehammer to it and, and um, concentrating it. Mm. But oftentimes, the concentration idea within meditation breaks the very thing that we're trying to do. Okay. That makes sense. An example of that would be frozen concentrated orange juice. Do you ever have you ever seen it? Have you ever? Uh, uh, when I was a kid, when I was a kid, my mom used to make that. Yeah. <laughs> right. What does she does she just give you the frozen concentrated orange juice, or does she no, put water? water. In? Yeah, you right. Mix it water. Which means that she takes the concentrates and makes it samadhi. She puts back the missing ingredient. You concentrate it for transportation, but then to put it to use, you've got to have all of the factors together. So that's an interesting way of understanding about what samadhi really is, okay. is the right organization of mind. Now, when the mind is organized correctly, that means that you don't want anything, that you're satisfied and content. And if you don't want anything, then you're very unlikely to go kill somebody to get it hmm. or to steal hmm. or to have malicious gossip. Right. So when your own mind is, is cleaned out, then you're unlikely then to go and spread malicious gossip because you don't have that in your mind. Right. This is why we look at the pre uh, of the uh, the precepts in a noble way, completely upside down to the way that they're taught because they're taught to ordinary kids. You got to go do the precepts first. And when you get really good at controlling your behavior, only then with Sila can you have some purification of mind. And after a long stint of purification of mind, then you can have purification of view. Mm -hmm. 
Okay. So that's Sila Samati Panya. Yeah. Well, guess what? Maybe that Sila doesn't take a long time. Maybe it's more of an attitude anyway. But in okay. fact, if a student sits down in the meditation hall and closes his eyes and folds his feet and uh, arms and hands and sits there still, his scene is perfect. Right. <laughs> Unless he's thinking about killing somebody. But right. if he's not thinking about killing anybody or whatever, breaking the precept, then he's then his uh, scene is perfect. It doesn't take that long. Right. That's the issue of the seclusion, that we need to get away from it all. And, and so seclusion and sila can be intermixed in that, uh, in that frame of mind. That the first thing we need to do is to get away from the temptations of doing the world in. Yeah. So that now we can now clean out and become friends with our own mind by having nurturing thoughts rather than uh, critical thoughts. And with that nurturing mind, we can put the mind state into a state of sukha that is exactly the opposite of dukkha. Everything is fine. I'm satisfied. Everything is good to go. Now, that's the kind of an ordinary state. Everybody has that on a regular basis. We just don't have very much of it. It doesn't last very long. But Western mentality, with all of this magical ideas, we think that it's got to be some sort of super-duper state. Mm. rather than a really nice ordinary state that you can maintain because you've got the skills to do it. Right. So this is the April Noble Path that can be practiced easily enough. And all we need is sati. That's the main skill because more than likely we're going to forget to practice correctly when we need it most, when things are the heaviest. Yeah. When we're most likely to follow our uh, heart or follow our instincts is when we need to wake up and say, wait a minute, let me figure out what's going on here and make a a wise choice about it. Right. Rather than following instincts. So this is why we want to practice meditation often is to get that sati built up so that you can remember over and over and over again that you're not going to just do this once a day. If you do it once a day or twice a day, then that means that 23 hours a day, you're solid into hindrances. Right. And we're going to be putting an end to those things, so we need to practice often. Okay. And so that means that any any opportunity that you have for practice is a good time to do it. Yep. To remember, that's all you have to do. If you can remember for five minutes, then great. Yeah. You can do it for ten minutes, then great. If you can do, if you can get yourself into a really nice state in twenty seconds, then do that. Right. Do a twenty-second meditation if it is successful, but don't sit there for twenty seconds and say, "Our oh, time's up. Now I got to go back to work." <laughs> right. <laughs> you know, I I gotta get I gotta get going soon, uh, and I also have to use the bathroom. Uh, but I, I don't know what your time schedule well, Joe, is. This has really been an enjoyable time. I'm really glad been, that you called. I mean, it's been all my pleasure. I mean, this has been awesome to meet you and hear you talk and stuff. It really touched me, like, just talking to you. I really well, appreciate it. When are you going to call back? What, when do you want me to call back? Uh, when you want to call back. But I would recommend about once or twice a week for a while. Once or twice a week. Okay. Mm-hmm. The basic whole point is I have very little to say, but it needs to be said over and over and over again in as many different ways in this combination, almost like a symphony, like Beethoven's Fifth Symphony. The whole show is nothing but da-da-da-da. That's the whole symphony. Okay. But it's da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-